We might look at several different humans and say that they share the universal called human nature. We might also talk about universals that are morals or numbers as universals. Do these universals actually exist or are they merely concepts in our mind? Let's ask William of Ockham. Let's talk about William of Ockham's nominalism. First we'll talk about Ockham's razor, then his nominalism, and then give a brief sketch of the history of philosophy so far, and then uh, sketch out some of the future implications that come after Ockham. All right, let's give some background for Ockham. Ockham lived from 1287 to 1347, right in the middle of the Middle Ages. He was an English Franciscan friar, scholastic philosopher, and theologian. He wrote on logic, semantics, physics, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, and political philosophy. So he wrote on a lot of different topics. He was quite the academic. He was also a faithful, a faithful Catholic who defended Christian doctrines and philosophy. He wasn't trying to uh, challenge his faith. He was trying to develop it. Right, Occam's Razor says that entities should not be multiplied beyond what is necessary. That's a summary of what he said. Uh, he never actually said this as a quotation, uh, but his Occam's Razor, his Razor has been summarized in this formula ever since. So entities should not be multiplied beyond what is necessary. Right, what is Occam's Razor? It's an assumption used as a tool for identifying how good a justification or an argument is. In other words, the simplest answer is best. Here's an example. You come up on a fence and it's all broken and in shambles. One explanation is that uh, a herd of cattle ran through it. Another explanation is that it was simply old and the nails rusted and so it fell apart. Of these two possible answers, the simpler one is that it was simply an old fence and it fell apart. So that answer is to be preferred. Here's another example. You have a flat tire on your car. One possible answer is that you ran over a nail. Another one is that someone in your neighborhood is going around flattening all the tires on everyone's cars. Well, of these two, the simpler answer is simply that you got a nail in your tire. And so that answer is to be preferred. Here's another illustration. Let's say you're sick, you're uh, nauseous in your stomach, right? One explanation is that you ate some food that was bad. Another possible explanation is that somebody tried to poison you. Of these two, the simpler answer is that you just ate something that had gone bad. So this answer is to be preferred. Do you like this theory? Can you see anything wrong with it? Occam's razor restated is, entities should not be multiplied beyond what is necessary. An application of this is to see how we can understand reality without needless complexity. All right, So this is a question in metaphysics. We want to explain reality, but we don't want to do so in a needlessly complex way. Uh, people, all philosophers agree, really, ancient philosophers, medieval philosophers, modern philosophers, etc., that no one wants a needlessly complex explanation of reality. Of course that's the case. But here's some criticisms to Occam's razor. It gets us nowhere because debates continue over what is necessary. All right? If entities should not be multiplied beyond what is necessary, how do we know what's necessary? We have to investigate something very thoroughly uh, before we really even understand what is necessary. So it really doesn't get us anywhere, because we still have to do all the hard work to figure out what is necessary. It too often takes the easy road, resting satisfied with an oversimplified explanation. All right? So maybe we don't yet know what is necessary, and we have to do a lot of work to figure out what is necessary for this explanation. Right? Reality is sometimes complex. 
And too often, Occam's razor encourages us to rest satisfied uh, too early on in our research, right? We come upon some initial explanation and we say, oh, that's good enough. But maybe there's more that we're not considering. Maybe there's more evidence to consider. It encourages the straw man fallacy and the watering down of arguments. That's to say, when you are attacking somebody else's argument, trying to say that somebody else's idea is irrational, Occam's razor tends to encourage people to misrepresent their opponent's argument and to oversimplify their opponent's argument rather than taking the opponent's argument with all of its complexity and nuances. We don't want to water down someone else's argument when we are trying to see if it is reasonable or not, as we investigate uh, the justification for the argument, and for the thesis. Also, another criticism of Occam's razor is that it seems more often the case that the correct answers are the more complex ones. Think about physics, right? Uh, physics is a very complex field of study, and the more you get into it, the more complex it seems, because reality seems to be complex. In fact, oftentimes, scientists and philosophers and other thinkers prefer the more complex explanation because it tends to be more nuanced and more explanatory of reality. Another criticism is uh, it is only appealing in cases where a theory backed by evidence is juxtaposed, that is, put up against, uh, a theory that has none, right? So it is only appealing in cases where a theory backed by evidence is juxtaposed with a theory that has no evidence. In reality, the merits of theories are tested not on the basis of their simplicity, but on the basis of evidence, right? This is another criticism of Occam's razor. Occam's motive in advocating his razor is to advocate re reform in both method and content of philosophy, specifically metaphysics, namely to simplify these fields. You see, he was responding to the complex philosophies developed by scholasticism. Scholasticism was a method of critical thought popular in medieval universities from the 1100s to the 1700s. It was influenced by Aristotelian logic, and it sought to extend knowledge through rigorous conceptual analysis, drawing careful distinctions and resolving contradictions. Let me ask you, is science complex? Is psychology complex? Is biology complex? Should we expect metaphysics to be simple or complex? Occam's application of his razor. First, we should not posit metaphysical entities if we aren't sure they exist, right? We cannot be sure that they exist. After all, human reason is limited, so metaphysical entities might be like uh, causation or numbers or um, the existence of God or let's say human nature as an essence, or animal nature as an essence, right? Beauty, things like this, especially in terms of essences like human nature, right? So we should not posit metaphysical entities if we aren't sure they exist. Number two, we cannot be sure they exist. After all, human reason is limited. Three, therefore, we should explain reality without them. This doesn't deny that necessary ontological entities exist. It just requires us to remain agnostic about it. Agnostic just means that we don't know. We don't have an answer. And so we're functioning without an answer. That's what agnostic means. The use of this is to always suspend judgment and never to deny that these metaphysical entities and essences exist. Later thinkers end up just using his, ra his razor to just deny. Because if you suspend judgment, ultimately that is uh, 
is going to be the same thing as denial if you continue to function off of that suspended judgment and use it as an assumption for other arguments and for fleshing out of your entire worldview. So in other words, this boils down to saying that if you can't show that something exists, then you shouldn't believe it. That is called verificationism. We'll get back to that and mention it here in a moment. Some consequences. Of course, I'll discuss these more as they come up later. Nominalism. Right? This is what the video is named after. Nominalism is uh, the view that's going to be discussed here shortly. Eventually, verificationism. Verificationism says that uh, you should not believe in something unless you can prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt and become absolutely certain. Of course, if that's not possible to prove things beyond a shadow of a doubt, then that means we have skepticism, which means, uh, which is a view that holds not only can we not discover the truth of matters, but that there is no truth. If we if we need that level of certainty, and there's no way of getting that level of certainty, then there must not even be truth. Skepticism. Let's talk about Occam's nominalism. Delve into that one more specifically. This is what he one thing he is quite famous for. Right? Let's ask what are universals? We see a bunch of particular apples, for example, and then we have a thought of apple. What are the essential qualities of an apple? That thought is shared in all of these particular apples, um, but it is also something separate from them, right? The commonality that is called apple is something shared with the, these four apples, but it is not identical with any of these four apples. The commonality itself is a thing, at least an idea. What about four different kinds of flowers? Well, now we have an idea of flower in our mind. What about different planets or uh, bodies that exist in space, right? We have an idea of planet in our mind. These are abstractions. But then we take these abstractions and we might combine them into something that is more common, uh, something that, it, that Apple flower, and planet all have in common. Like beauty, right? All these things are beautiful. This is more abstract than those things, all right? And another one might be logic. Another one might be good, like moral goodness, right? These are universals. These are abstract universals. Do they exist? Are they real or not? All right, so here's the development, the background for Occam's nominalism. Plato's theory of the forms claimed all universals exist independently of material objects in the realm of the forms, i.e. form and matter are fundamentally separate. All right, uh, you can see my view, or you can see my presentation on Plato for some more detail on that. Aristotle disagreed and said form and matter are inseparable. Forms are in particular things. You can see my video on Aristotle for some more on that. For example, chair, the idea of chair, the form of chair, what it means to call something a chair, the essential attributes of a chair, these, this is in chairs. If there were no chairs, chairness would not exist. Thomas Aquinas, in the 13th century, Christianized Aristotle's philosophy. Aristotle didn't deny universals. He said that they are still real. Universals are necessary for all reasoning, in fact. Universal qualities in particular things still exist as universals. So for Aristotle and Aquinas, universals are still real. One of the most important universals is human nature. Human nature does not exist as some sort of entity that's floating around in some abstract 
realm of the forms. No, human nature exists in humans. But human nature is a universal that is still true. There is such a thing as human nature. And it's a real thing that we all share, according to Aristotle and Aquinas. Right? Occam, however, in the 13th century, denies universals and affirms that we can only know particulars, right? a particular person or a particular apple. Here's a definition of nominalism. It's the theory that universals, or general ideas, are mere names without any corresponding reality. And then only particular objects exist. Right? So that means there is no such thing as human nature, for example, or beauty, or moral. Only par- this is only partially based on Occam's razor, as we talked about. Right? He holds that we have no compelling reason to believe in universals, so we should refrain from doing so until we have more evidence. Theories of universals are incoherent and self-contradictory. Universals have no reality in Aristotelian categories, contrary to Aristotle. Universals only exist as mental concepts. Universals are simply patterns observed when thinking of several things at the same time. This is important. So his view of universals is that they are only mental concepts, and they're not real things, real descriptions about reality. It's sort of coincidence. It's just a way that we make sense of things. So if you have a pile of two of two or three apples, you have a pile of three apples, and then you have three flowers, and the commonality between these is the number three, three is not something uh, that exists and is not real. Numbers are not real. It's just a way for us to think about things in our minds. And so we invent numbers, for example. Of course, uh, inventing symbols to represent quantities, we may invent symbols um, that we use, for example, in physics and in math, but uh, that does not deny the real existence of quantity, that there is such a thing as quantity. Quantity is a real thing in the world. And the laws of physics and the math within physics, these can be considered real um, in Aristotelian categories, but not in Occam's nominalism. Right, so here's some later implications of his nominalism. The rejection of essences and natures, contrary to Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, and pretty much anybody before Occam. Right, for example, human nature. We already mentioned that. Also, a rejection of moral objectivism, because moral objectivism is going to say that morals are universal. But this is a denial of universals, Occam. Here's a simple argument against nominalism. I don't have time for more in this presentation, unfortunately. There are many more arguments against nominalism, and nominalism is a very important subject. I just don't have space in this video for a more comprehensive argument against nominalism. So here's just one very simple argument against it. Nominalism says there are no universals, only particulars. This means every object is a particular. Particularity is in reality, not in the mind. Right? This is an assumption of nominalism that particularity is in reality, that every object is a particular. So particularity is in reality, not in the mind. If every object is a particular, then particularity is universal. If particulars are in reality, not in the mind, in other words, if a particular apple that I have in my hand, if that apple is in reality and it is a particular object, it's not in the mind, it's a particular object in reality, if that's the case, then universality is in reality, not just in the mind, because every apple is a particular. Therefore, there are universals in reality, right? So this is a sort of way of showing how Occam's nominalism is self-defeating. This is quite a terse argument, 
Judge for yourself whether nominalism or universalism makes more sense of common observation and experience. Nominalism and universalism both have many different varieties, but we want to ask whether they're rational, whether they make sense, have good evidence to back them, and whether they make sense of common observation and experience. For example, in common observation and experience, can we ask whether good and evil are real? Right? Is it um, is it an objective statement to say that Hitler did something that was evil? Right? That would if it is real. If good and evil are real, they're universals. Right? That would be contrary to nominalism. Is morality in general real? Is humanity a real thing we have in common? Right? Is there a difference between essential and accidental properties of human? Essential just means uh, these are the things that all humans share that is essential to something being called a human rather than being called an animal or a rock, all right, versus accidental properties like male or female or the color of your hair, right? Is there a difference between essential and accidental properties? And if so, this is a claim that certain universals exist. Are cause and effect real? Right? That structure of cause and effect that we see in the world, those are universals. Does real apply to more than one particular object? Right? If real applies to more than one particular object, then real is itself a universal concept that is really in the, the world. All right? So this is just an assessment of Occam's nominalism. Of course, we will see that Occam's nominalism has a great influence on, has, has a profound influence on philosophy after Occam. So here's a brief sketch of the history of philosophy. Here's a timeline, all right? Uh, right at the beginning of Western philosophy, we've got Thales of Miletus around 600 BC. And then later we've got Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and between them, of course, we've got the pre-Socratics. And then later, um, after Alexander the Great, who was a student of Aristotle, we have Greece, uh, which is expanding and it's influencing uh, other areas of the world, right? Greece is in Europe, and uh, the land that it conquers continues to expand, and so Hellenism just means the spread of Greek culture and language and philosophy. So Hellenism is the spread of Greek culture. And then we have uh, 0 or 4 BC, which is the birth of Jesus. This is um, the anchor point that the calendar has been based off of. All right, Hellenism continues through this period up until almost 400 AD. Uh, through the Roman Empire. The Romans adopted so much of Greek culture. In fact, their religion of multiple uh, gods in polytheism uh, was basically just an adoption of the Greek religion and a renaming of each of the gods. So, for example, Greek Zeus was renamed to Jupiter. For example. All right, and so... Hellenism continues. That is a spread of the ideas, or there's a spread of Greek culture, but within that means that the influence of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle continues through Europe and uh, the Middle East. Late towards the end of this, you have Augustine, and then you have the Middle Ages, the medieval period. Uh, just for Remembrance, it's easy to just think 500 to 1500 is uh, roughly the Middle Ages. Of course, within here, right in the middle, we've got Thomas Aquinas. This is just a sketch of some of the major thinkers. You've got all sorts of other medieval thinkers as well. And then you have uh, William of Ockham, who comes right after Thomas Aquinas and responds to a lot of what Aquinas says. Right? And many, many others in the Middle Ages. And then at the end of this, you have Rene Descartes, who is so radical and uh, changes the course of thinking that we have a split 
and philosophy. Right, the Enlightenment occurs from around 1600 to 1800. Now, the Enlightenment is a broader uh, kind of label for this period, specifically in philosophy. We talk about modernism, where um, modernists have rejected a metaphysical foundation for ethics and are using a new theory of of uh, epistemology called empiricism, which says that true something is true if it is provable uh, by experimentation or if we learn it through our senses. Right. So there's a radical reliance on a uh, new kind of empiricism and rationalism that is uh, focused largely on individuals and what individual on what an individual can understand just based off of his own reason so there's a radical shift here and we'll cover that in some later videos anyway the enlightenment is a significant break from the trajectory of classical philosophy up until this point each generation was kind of just developing uh, what had gone before and Although there were many different ideas uh, within this and disagreements within this classical tradition, they were largely characterized by some common assumptions, such as um, that, the, that the universe is real, that ethics are objective, that you can, uh, that you first learn by studying reality, and that ideas come from a study of uh, reality. Okay, and then we have the Enlightenment here. Soon after the Enlightenment begins, right at, right at the beginning of the Enlightenment, you have David Hume proposing, for example, emotivism and critiquing a lot of the philosophy that has gone before him. Right, he he is in line with Occam's nominalism uh, in a lot of different ways. Later on, you have Immanuel Kant who is probably the most influential philosopher within the Enlightenment, and after him develops postmodernism, because Kant sees a problem in modernity in this, uh, trying, this effort in modernity to try to investigate reality and learn what is real. Immanuel Kant is going to say that we cannot know what's real because we only know reality. We only come in contact with reality through our senses, and our senses can be flawed. And the only way that we understand anything from our senses is we have these categories in our mind. So we cannot escape the categories in our mind, and we always we always translate reality into what we already understand. In other words, when we look at reality, we, uh, we cannot be sure of what we see. We cannot escape our own bias. We'll cover that more when we get to Immanuel Kant. This kicks off moderni postmodernism, uh, which is rejecting a lot of what came before in modernity. Uh, at the early end of this, you have Soren Kierkegaard, who starts uh, to talk about existentialism. And then later, you have Friedrich Nietzsche, who rejects morality completely, uh, saying that good and evil are just fictions. They are not real things out there. They are um, just inventions that are not even necessarily particularly useful. And then in the end, we have uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and Camus, um, more recent existentialists and those who have come after them, who claim that there is no meaning in the universe and uh, all is absurd. And so there's no good and evil, there's no value, and all we can do is sort of bear with our existence. Anyway, we will come back to this sketch later in this course as we tease out what some of these philosophers discuss. 
Some philosophers, of course, continue with a more classical tradition. You have Neo-Aristotelianism, Neo-Thomism, which is Thomas Aquinas, and much of Christian philosophy and other different schools of thought. So that huge split occurs uh, about 500 years ago, but there are many who continue the classical development of philosophy along classical lines. Nominalism rejects essentialism, first and foremost. Let's get back to Occam. Modernity tries to cling to realism and find non-Christian foundations for objective traditional morals. Right? Post-modernity rejects realism and objectivism for phenomenology and relativism. Again, this is, a, this is an overall sketch. We'll cover these things later in this course as well. And then verificationism, which says you should not believe something unless it has been proven with absolute certainty, Verificationism fails and leads to skepticism, nihilism, and absurdism, which is to say that if you have to be absolutely certain about something before you believe it, then that standard is so incredibly high, we can never know anything. And since we can never know anything, in fact, maybe there is nothing really to know. There is no absolute truth. There is nothing to know. That's skepticism. Right? And then nihilism says that there's no there's no truth, there's no meaning, there's no value in the world. Absurdism is sort of a practical application of that and says that there's nothing we can do about it other than just try to continue to live our lives because there's no meaning and we can't there's no meaning in the universe and we can't give it one. That's what absurdism says. Again, we'll cover that later in the course. This is just an overall sketch. Uh, in the end, we live with the full implications of the Enlightenment, or we recover something that we've lost. Right? That's to say that by the end of this course, we will juxtapose um, some philosophers who maintain a classical tradition, and those who we will juxtapose those classical thinkers against some very contemporary thinkers who express the full implications of the change that happened in the Enlightenment. Let's do the write-up for Occam's Nominalism. Do you believe in universals? Why? If yes, name some. 